I honestly didn't see that part coming. Um, because I was like, like I honestly remember f- how I felt sitting there as I was watching this. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, like what? <laughs> you know, like I, I for like a brief moment had a difficult time trying to follow uh, what the reasoning was. I'm like, is he being serious, Data? Like when he's apologizing to Reyna and you know saying, look, I did this. This guy here that I just killed. You know, was a fanatic. He went off. Welcome to Go Go Kaiju Show, where we have a healthy obsession with kaiju. I am your co-host Kent, and with me is your other co-host Jason. And welcome to our two hundredth episode. Oh shit! You didn't even tell me that before we started, <laughs> and we spent the last half hour talking before coming on here. Yeah, we got a little bit too distracted with uh, some of the talk that we had. Yeah, we were giving each other health advice as far as like (laughs) cooking oils and stuff. But yeah, after 14 years of uh, doing this podcast, we finally made it to episode 200. We technically have more if you count commentaries and any other side episodes we've done. But then, yeah, we would have gotten to this sooner had we not uh, had we uh, not take long breaks, a year and a half hiatus. And doing you know, episodes every other two weeks, <laughs> like we're doing right now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hey, you know what? We got there. Yes. <laughs> Give us money, please. We 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 have a milestone. But uh, anyways, is that going to be too uh, over the top or anything like some of these other podcasts or uh, live yes, shows? Yes, true. Yeah. <laughs> like they make such a big deal out of it. Yeah, they may get there in like six months. Took us fourteen years. Let's see anyone else try that. Yeah. I mean, if it's if it's a, a thousandth episode, it may be a little bit different. But uh, I mean, two hundred. I 500. think when you do a hundred, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I think the next milestone should be five hundred. And then after that, a thousand. Yeah, I know. It's been so many years since we've last done uh, episode 100. I think it was 10 years ago, <laughs> but uh, I don't necessarily, I can't remember what we've done with, with that one, but uh, I didn't either. Yeah. You know what we <laughs> should just do? a lot of in memory. You know what we should do is make it our goal that we quit this podcast when we hit episode 1000. Oh, and episode yeah. 1000 is looking over our career. And then saying goodbye to the world. <laughs> no way. There, there's no way we're going to get to that. No, we seriously that. could. No, here, here's one way if, that can easily help us. If we start counting those commentaries and any of those like little side episodes. We but, then, but then all these episodes are going to be screwed up. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> we can just do the recount from there. Like, okay, starting episode 200 and then start with the commentary, even if that was 15 years ago, whatever, um, (laughs) and make that as 201. Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to deal with all that because some of that, like the images and all that stuff that we have is already a done deal. I mean, he can't he can't take the time. To spend I, I, an additional several hundred hours of his life dude, to dude, recreate graphics, dude. <laughs> I'm I'm the one that's doing all this. Stuff. I know. I literally you have no idea what. No, I've done I. I mean, I have an idea, <laughs> but I'm giving you garbage. I'm giving you garbage. But but anyways, we're getting uh, off topic. <laughs> Once again, here. By the way, Jason, what cooking oils again? I. <laughs> Do you want me to come over there and beat the living shit out of you? <laughs> it's going to take you about 12 hours to get here. But yes, I know. <laughs> I'll make the uh, effort. <laughs> I could see you like thinking about it and then not doing it. But anyways, uh, what we are doing now, we are continuing our sort of Netflix um, animated features. And we are concluding that section with the Ultraman anime trilogy. Uh, it, it was a series of 13 episodes apiece, and it first debuted in 2019. And what we are doing is today's episode is going to be devoted to season one. A couple weeks from now, it'll be season two. And then a couple weeks after that, it'll be season three. And then an overall look at this series as a whole. Yeah. So I'm going to correct you. 
uh, each season isn't 13 episodes each. Oh, it's season not. two has six, and third and last season has 12. I wonder, did season two come out during like the early days of COVID? Uh, Is that why? It came out in 2022, so... Uh, COVID you could have interfered. A few years after first season, and then season three came out a year after. That's incredible, though. It came out three years. Now, Grant, again, COVID. Like, COVID probably at least postponed it. COVID could have even messed with them in terms of, like, getting people together to animate <clears throat> and, like, write and all that stuff, too, probably. Wow. Okay, so actually, now that we know that... Uh, <laughs> Instead of doing three podcasts on the series, you will want to do two podcasts where we cover season two, three, and then the whole thing, since we found out that season two is much shorter. Uh, why don't we talk about it once we get done with this episode? Okay. I just assumed they were all... I'm sorry, folks. I didn't think <laughs> <so jumping. laughs> this is why you come yeah. listen to us. You, you listen to Amateur Hour here. We know yeah. who we are. <laughs> You should have done your freaking research. <laughs> I've always said on this podcast, look, if you're looking for like high quality research, occasionally we do that, but not very often. But if you're looking for high quality <laughs> research, this is not the podcast. But if you're looking for fun, this is the podcast to come to. Mm -hmm. So um, like I was telling Jason right before we came on, I'm a little unsure of how to go about discussing season one here because it's not the full story. And even though in some ways it has its own self-contained story yeah. that has a conclusion, but not all the threads of the overarching story have their threads tied. So, um, I, I'm a you know I'm a little hesitant to kind of approach certain things uh, with finality until we get through the whole thing, but at the same time I will overall judge it as just a season to the best of my ability, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah hopefully this will be a, a fruitful discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, as far as season, well before we move on i just want to say if you see a subscribe button down below or above us make sure to hit that subscribe button and smash the like bu button and uh if you're listening to us on your favorite audio podcast make sure to uh subscribe to us and give us a rating all right so let's get into uh the anime ultraman season one i noticed throughout watching all 13 episodes there was never really a title card sequence mm -hmm. they just delved right into the story and because they because they think it's like uh the title cards are just a waste of time let's just get right into the it could be <laughs> they might have thought that um <laughs> we don't have the extra hundred dollars to do this yeah um, <laughs> we're gonna spend it over here instead but sure. anyway um this is mainly a continuation of the original Ultraman uh, TV series. And original. arguably, too, even a continuation of like Ultra 7, uh, maybe even Ultraman Ace to some extent, too. Although that's maybe debatable, uh, considering one of the characters here in this series. I would, I would just say it's more or less a... Um a direct sequel to the original 1966 Ultraman. And I would, with the, uh, with way things are, I don't think they don't, uh, blend in like some of the other Ultramans or shows or any of that sort, but they just sort of include them with this direct sequel with Dan Morboshi and some of the other, uh, Ultraman characters. I'm, I know I haven't seen Ace and all that, but I'm assuming it's the same name for the character in that particular series uh, and such. Yeah. And so, uh, again, I should know better because we've done a lot of reviews, even in recent um, episodes. I'm not quite sure how to go about starting this. Um, how, about, I mean, how about the... Uh, kind of the self-contained uh, story uh, for this first season okay. where, they were, where they were trying to investigate uh, who blew up this uh, plane that we uh, 
encounter in the first episode and who's behind it and everything. Well, even that kind of gets dropped in large chunks of this first season because we get these side stories as far as uh, Reina Sayama, who is a secondary character. She is a very popular Japanese pop artist in which our main character, uh, Shinjiro, is infatuated with and, you know, tries to hit on her and that sort of thing periodically over the course of the 13 episodes. Um, and it's got, it's got that uh, cliché type of uh, teenager um, storyline as far as trying to find himself or herself and uh, going on this journey of, you know, being hesitant on making decisions until kind of towards a uh, finale where they know who they are. Yeah. And so let me do the best I can to sort of give an, a, a, a synopsis of kind of the stories that are going on throughout these 13 episodes. And it's pretty dense. The, these 13 episodes are very dense with a lot of, Characters, character threads, and stories, and what have you. So, uh, you know, Shinjiro is the son of Hayata, the original Ultraman. And he grows up, he's, you know, what, probably 17, 16, 17, 18, somewhere in there. And uh, what ends up happening is he, they find out that the Science Patrol actually did not, let me, let me restart that. It, it, the, the episode starts out with the Science Patrol supposedly having uh, been disbanded for about a decade. But what ends up happening is that Ide, and I think that's the silly character, right, from yeah. the original Ultraman series? Ide, Ide or Ido. Which, he's actually pretty serious in this. That's, that's what I was going to say, too, is, you know, with all the quirkiness, I uh, the guy who portrays as Ide or Ido. Uh, however you go about it from the original Ultraman to this one where it's a direct sequel where for whatever reason, he's now a really serious guy in a way. It, he's it, not uber serious, serious, but he's more serious than he yeah, was in the original show. It sort of throws you off in a way because you know uh, the Ido, Ide or Ido character that you know from the original Ultraman TV show where he's kind of that uh, goofy uh, uh, guy that kind of uh, elevates some of the seriousness that happens from time to time in that uh, TV show to uh, and then transition into this. It kind of throws you off a little bit. Let me just say this whole series by and large, if it's a continuation of the original Ultraman, a lot of things here throw you for a loop uh, mm -hmm. considering what they do here. Yeah. But um Ide reveals to Hayata that really the Science Patrol never totally disbanded, that the old Science Patrol building is now a museum. However, in the bowels of the building, they have kept the Science Patrol going. And in many ways, it's not only sort of run by Ide, but it's also headed by an alien, a Zetonian alien named Edo, who is kind of a Cyclops looking alien with, for lack of a better explanation, an elf type uh, top uh, for a head. Um, and so they realize that the reason why they keep this going is not only because of other threats, but because of Hayata has Ultraman blood running through his veins and also his son. And so what ends up happening is that they eventually recruit Shinjiro to be the new Ultraman. Now, Shinjiro and eventually Moroboshi, which if you're not familiar with Ultra Seven, you know, you're not going to realize that Moroboshi's Ultra Seven. Yeah, you know, I just want to say one thing about uh, Dan Moroboshi. Uh, like I said, it's been many years since I've last talked about uh, the Ultraman MA TV show uh, that I discussed many years ago on uh, our podcast episode. I've never realized how much of a stick up <laughs> a hole that he is in this show. You need one of those characters, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but he eventually becomes ultra seven and 
Um, Moroboshi's sort of like like a mentor of sorts, even though he doesn't want to be a mentor to Shinjiro. But then they end up uh, making Shinjiro the next Ultraman. And these new Ultraman are basically Iron Man. Let's face it. Mm-hmm. The, the Subaraya and Netflix are like, hey, at this moment in time, Avengers Endgame is in theaters. The Marvel movies have always been popular. We're going to make our Ultraman stuff for this series like Iron Man suits. But the, so that's but a the, little annoying, but you, you can maybe say a little bit of that, even though the uh, anime is based off of the the manga that's been around since uh, 2011. So it's been at least a few years since the original Ultraman, probably uh, not Ultraman, Iron Man came out and possibly Iron Man too. Too. Sure. Yeah, but it's got that uh, uh, anime or manga flair to those suits. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is they're trying to investigate this weird um, plane crash that happened on number of years earlier. And this weird looking Ultraman type of character shows up. And then that same Ultraman character shows up and kind of stalks uh, Shinjiro. They eventually get into a tussle with Hayata in like a soccer facility in Tokyo. And I thought he... Uh, this Ultraman character who we find out is actually Bemular. They named themselves Bemular, the first villain. Uh, I thought they killed Hayata, but no, they didn't kill Hayata. Shinjiro comes in, uh, kind of fights off Bemular a little bit, then Bemular eventually retreats. And then uh, Hayata really for the rest of the series is almost non-existent uh, after this. And, then they kind of go into this whole thing where Shinjiro is a, occasionally battling uh, some monsters, um, but then learning a little bit from Moroboshi. Moroboshi is very irritated by Shinjiro because he thinks Shinjiro um, should know a little bit more about how special he is and really understand how important his role is in being an Ultraman. And, uh, Moroboshi kind of teaches him like there's a part in Tokyo where there's all these aliens, but the most of them use human disguises, technology to make themselves look human. Uh, there's an informant in this area that they use to try to track down any aliens that uh, may end up kind of going off grid, so to speak, that may be causing trouble. But then there's been this string of murders uh, that they aren't quite sure what happens. Uh, I mean, excuse me, for what the motive is for all those. So then they end up sort of investigating that, realizing that an alien more than likely is involved here. And then um, they um, they they do some investigation, and then they realize that the person who is committing these murders is a Reina Sayama uh, fanboy. And eventually we end up seeing this alien, Iguro, if I remember the name correctly, uh, who has like four eyeballs on his head here. He's uh, kind of he, like a Pikmin. Yeah, kind of. Uh, he's sort of like a prince in a different world. And he's a huge Reina Sayama fan, like totally in love with her. He's been killing these people, they eventually find out. Well, then everything comes to a head at a Reina Sayama uh, concert where... Uh, data or data uh, shows up and he basically ends up like threatening Rina Sayama and fights Ultra 7 and Ultraman then Igoru uh, shows up and then he kills Igoru and then he comes out and apologizes to Rina Sayama for saying you know please don't take my threat seriously I only had to do that to bring the murderer out into the open like it's this whole twist Mm-hmm. All of a sudden that Data, along with other aliens, are part of the Star Council organization that made a peace accord odd number of years earlier. And, um, you know, they're also at the same time trying to investigate Bemular. Bemular shows up at this concert as well. And, like, you're starting to get a feeling that Bemular isn't what he appears to be. And then... Like, there's so much going on here in these 13 episodes. I'm trying to condense it as best as I can. And then eventually, uh, Shinjiro meets this young kid, uh, Seiji, Seiji, mm-hmm. 
um, who finds out that he is Ultraman. And we sort of think he's sort of a villain, but then we eventually find out he is Ultraman Ace. He is sort of a rogue Ultraman whose dad is an alien. And we eventually find out Seiji actually doesn't have any limbs because his uh, mother and he were on that plane that blew up that we see earlier in the series. He somehow survives. Bemular saves him and then gives him as a baby to this alien who ends up already having a child, raises Seiji as well. He's very good in electronics and stuff, so he builds Seiji's synthetic arms and what have you, and then eventually an Ultraman Ace looking suit. Mm-hmm. And so Seiji's sort of trying to get in good graces with Shinjiro and the Science Patrol. The Science Patrol denies him um, uh, 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 membership into the organization, and they sort of follow him a little bit and then give him information. So they give Seiji information as to where these assassins are who actually were responsible. It wasn't Bemular who was responsible for the uh, plane explosion, but it was these assassins. So they are followed to this uh, mansion. And then what ends up happening is Moroboshi, Shinjiro, and the rest of Science Patrol are like, look, this kid is going to get himself killed. He can't do it all by himself. Let's kind of help him out. So they get in before Seiji actually does any action. The build, the house blows up, and then a kind of a big fight ensues. Uh, Ultraman and Ultra Seven are nearly killed by this assassin named um, Ace Killer, I believe, is what he was called. Yeah, I'm not I want to say sure. he called himself Ace Killer. Yeah, I'm not um, entirely sure myself. And this other um, Ultraman type of villain, Seiji, ends up coming out, and then ends up getting into the. Uh, a fight with this ace killer is almost seemingly killed by this ace killer. And then Shinjiro all of a sudden is able to take the limiter off of his Ultraman suit and magically take uh, this assassin out. And then Bemular comes into the picture, stops a nuclear bomb type of object, which is being shot out of an invisible spaceship 200 some odd miles outside of earth and at the same time destroys this invisible spaceship we have no idea as far as what this ship was it's never mentioned after this and then bemular takes seiji says it's not the first time I'm, i've brought a human back to life and disappears and then ultraman does this typical superhero thing where he flies off towards the end credits roll for the last time in season one there's a hell of a lot of stuff I didn't even touch on, but that's sort of the main driving point. And one thing I forgot to mention is that um, I believe it was Data who eventually revealed uh, to someone that the Star Console organization is ultimately behind that plane crash because there were representatives of various planets uh, involved in that Star Console that they wanted dead. We still have absolutely no idea what the overarching story is as far as the reasons why they wanted those people dead. Um, and then the informant, we find out too, ends up knocking out Seiji's surrogate alien dad and carries him off somewhere uh, to be continued. <laughs> There's a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's an awful lot to cover. <laughs> Yeah, as far as far as season one, just with thir- uh, thirteen episodes alone, and with kind of the main storyline of who's behind this uh, uh, explosion of the plane and and all that, but then you also have quite a bit of other uh, side stories. I mean, it's it's going to be a TV show. So there's going to be multiple seasons for it. But um, in my opinion, with just season one alone, it seems, it seems a little too much sort of say, because I mean, they probably weren't entirely sure if there was going to be additional seasons, you know, with Netflix and all that stuff. But um I can sort of understand if if there was going to be more seasons after this. Um, but then again, it just felt a little too much. And, and uh, 
according to the manga, which I haven't read for many years, but as far as I can remember, I don't remember there being so much condensed within a certain amount of chapters compared to the first season. It just felt a little too much going on for 13 episodes or for just one season. Uh, it could have spread out a little bit more. They, For me, I would think that they could have introduced Ace in season two. Um, it felt a little too much to have um, three Ultramen in here. I would say two was enough at this point in time. <laughs> What the heck? Uh, I didn't Jesus do throwing anything. a secret party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, you weren't invited, but <laughs> <laughs> I live like 500 miles away. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it it just felt a little too much for just one season story wise. Could have dealt. Could have had at at max two Ultraman in here, and could have just uh, introduced uh, the third. Ultraman in season two. Yeah, I mean, I knew because of my, again, I'm not a huge anime watcher, but in my limited exposure, I had a feeling that this was going to go down similar territory of like the anime Godzilla trilogy and even the Gamera Rebirth miniseries where there was going to be some dense storytelling, probably some you know, switcheroony uh, things going on too, where there will be surprises. So I was aware of that more than likely occurring at some point, uh, probably obviously not season one per se, but I thought, well, you know, there could be some small twists just to kind of get the rest of the stuff going later. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think it was too dense. Um, I am all for getting as much as you can, but I think at the same time too, there is, such a thing as doing so much to where it's hard to keep track of everything because we have data involved for like a, like two or three episodes. There's even a scene where he's with the informant later where, you know, once again, they're still trying to figure out like who's involved behind all this. And then it kind of makes you wonder, well, is data, even though apparently at that concert at the end of when he killed Igaru, that he was all well and good he was still looking for another alien and he data could even be maybe still a villain eventually. I don't know because again, this is just season one, but and then, yeah, like you were seeing with ACE while interesting, that was a little too much. I thought the whole Reina Sayama thing and then the whole switcheroo that they did at that concert, like I honestly didn't see that part coming. Um, <laughs> Because I was like, like I honestly remember f how I felt sitting there as I was watching this. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, like what? <laughs> you know, like I, I for like a brief moment had a difficult time trying to follow uh, what the reasoning was. I'm like, is he being serious, Data? Like when he's apologizing to Reina and you know saying, look, I did this. This guy here that I just killed you know, was a fanatic. He went off kilter. And so I had to kill him. Well, that sort of thing. Um, not only that, but then you had, uh, three humans within that crowd that sort of were the masterminds of all this. And then they kind of, uh, oh, got God. connection. They got in connection with this, um, this Prince Pikmin. And then they had that one, uh, sort of assailant that's been actually going around and taking, uh, taking uh, out all these other fans. You have to watch the series. There's just so <laughs> much that it's just, it is incredibly dense. And I'm not too shocked that it's dense, but I'm a little shocked at just to the degree of how dense it is. I'm really hoping that even though it's, now six episodes for season two that just even within those six episodes, the pressure valve will kind of come undone a little bit to where we can kind of get past a few of these. I'm not saying drop them. I'm saying maybe quickly conclude some of these plot points uh, efficiently mm -hmm. and, and satisfactorily. And um, it's a lot. 
mm-hmm. really is. I mean, I just, I still am just trying to figure out, like, again, what that invisible spaceship was because it blows up. They never say anything else about it. And I'm sure it'll come back in season two, but the fact that nothing else was mentioned about it was weird. And I'm like, people just kind even in the Science Patrol, they're continuing on with life as if everything was happily ever after for the most part. Oh, Ultron and- does the typical superhero fly off. And I'm like, but and- this giant spaceship was just blowing up. Like, Well, and like I said, that I'm assuming how things went that they weren't entirely sure if there was going to be additional seasons after that. And, and also, hence... When it comes to Netflix, like a lot of things tend to don't get renewed for another season because there has been many shows on Netflix that don't get renewed for mm-hmm. a second season or what have you. So they probably assume that it, it depends on how many views that they get with the show and if there's any interest within that. So they, they pr- sort of assume trying to condense a lot of these uh, sub stories within this first season, that could be one of the reasons to behind it. So there, there can be multiple reasons. And I'm going to tell you something right now. And I figured this out pretty early. I'm letting you know right now, Bemilar is Yuko and Yuko is the girl that Seiji talked about quite a bit during the episodes he was in about, this girl who is older than he is and that he really cared for. And the reason why I'm telling you it's Yuko is because I realized very early on when I saw Bimular, I'm like, those are very wide hips. Those are the hips of a woman. And kind of towards the end there, when Bimular takes the nearly dying body of Seiji, I'm like, okay, like it's not only a woman, but it's Yuko, this Yuko girl that he had been talking about since it, whatever episode number he arrived in. So I'm telling you right now, Bemular is Yuko. Yeah, I, I never even bothered to look at the hips. <laughs> so you had a little bit more detail in that. I, well, I uh, looked at it. I'm like, well, sense. you know, because it had this male voice and it said Bemular. I'm like, <clears throat> anatomically, that's not a male because of the white hips. Yeah, so. I didn't. I didn't really dive too much into that, so I'll I'll keep that in mind uh, moving forward to kind of look more into that uh, sort of thing. But uh, in that regard, uh, do you have any more addition to as far as a story or oh gosh, <laughs> like again, <laughs> like how do you even tackle something like this? Um, again, it's just dense. It is. I I will say this, though. Despite it being overly dense, it is by and large well told. And it definitely leaves you hanging for season two. um, But ties it up enough to where you feel partially satisfied to where, like you said, if they didn't renew it for a second season, you're like, okay, well, there's some knots that haven't been tied. I'll just go with it. Um, It's entertaining enough. It's interesting enough. But yeah, it's it's more dense than it should be (laughs) so um with that what do you think of the main characters and as well as the uh, supporting characters i mean we get um hayata and ide uh from the original ultraman but then you also get additions of dan moroboshi here which much much younger version of Damo Boshi compared to the Ultra 7 and a jerk uh, <laughs> TV. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. And, and then I'm assuming this uh, Seiji uh, Hakudo is uh, the Ultraman ace from the uh, the other uh, from the Ultraman I don't ace think so because show. Ace my son watched Ace uh, during COVID and then finished it up like a year, year and a half later I don't. I didn't watch a lot of it with him, but if I remember correctly, Ace became Ace when a man and woman um, member from the Science Patrol type of organization that is in that series came together. Uh, I don't remember the guy's name, but it was a man and a woman. They had to like do the Ultraman thing w- together, 
and they became ace. Hmm. Like they worked together as one Ultraman. Ultraman. <laughs> so that's yeah, how that one worked. Yeah, I haven't really watched a whole lot of uh, some of the uh, the show uh, Ultraman TV shows in between. Was it uh, Ultra Seven and uh, all the way to Ultra Leo? So I'm kind of I haven't watched any of those in between uh, those two episodes. So I mean, one of these times I need to get around to it. But uh, but yeah, none, nonetheless, um, as far as the main and supporting characters, what do you think of these uh, additions? They're fine, I guess. Like. <laughs> um, these are characters that in some ways are types and in other ways are being slowly fleshed out to be a little bit more than types. Uh, Shinjiro, I would argue to some respects is a stereotypical hero that we get in these types of stories where he's a good looking young man who may be a little awkward with the girls who doesn't necessarily understand how special and important he is and you know go, finds his way it's um it's sort of a smaller version of the hero's journey in some respect um moroboshi is the stereotypical stick in the mud who is an ally but doesn't want to be an ally because he finds the the new hero to be just repulsive Seiji is kind of this anti-hero, complicated, I think, eventual hero that will be a part of their team uh, moving forward. To I think he'll end up being admitted to the Science Patrol once he gets fully healed uh, by Bemular or Yuko. Um, I, I guarantee you that's what's, what's going to happen. Um, and they're fine. Um, I find it just weird, though, that Hayata and Ide are more serious than their Showa series counterparts. Um, it just, like, I don't mind people being serious because, look, you know, we're all complicated human beings. We all are at times goofy and stuff. And then serious, and even that original series occasionally portray these two characters as serious on occasion. And I'm not saying Hayata was overly goofy, but he seemed to be a bit more laid back, while Ide was sort of the comedic relief. It's just weird seeing them more serious here. Especially with Dan Moroboshi Mor- in this one, where he just, he was kind of the real a-hole like he's really separated from his original uh, type of character that he was in Ultra Seven uh, TV show, as in like with this within uh, that TV show he was sort of like uh, Hayata in a way, whereas in this anime he really deviates from uh, from that uh, character type, where he's just kind of that. Uh, it's, like you said, sticking them up, but also kind of that annoying a hole uh, at times, and it's just really throws you for a loop. That that's sort of the whole theme with this uh, anime, even though it's a direct sequel, like what you said, that it just really throws you off for a loop with uh, certain things and a lot of the things that you know from uh, the past Ultraman TV shows where these characters come from and they're they sort of deviate or really deviate from their character types yeah it's just it i mean like i said they're fine i I mean i guess i i want to know where shinjiro's mom hayata's wife is nothing's ever mentioned about her what happened there are we ever gonna learn i mean i'm willing to keep that open because this isn't a complete story yeah i think I think in the beginning, I don't know, like you see a, uh, a woman in the apartment where Hayata is in the first episode before the 10 year skip. I'm not sure if that was his wife or if that was uh, the sister or maybe one of the coworkers. Who knows? You don't yeah. really know who that is and you don't even see him ever again after that 10 year leap. 
yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, is it does it really matter? No, not really, because so much other stuff is going on. We don't need we don't need any more yeah. convoluted <laughs> stuff to go on here. But um, they're fine, I guess. Like that's one of the least complicated things to follow in this 13 episode season so far. <laughs> so um, with that, um, what do you make of? the animation portion where I think around this time when it was made around 2019, I think this might've been around the time when the Godzilla anime trilogy uh, was coming out. And this is sort of the, the early days of uh, when they were starting to do the CGI animation for anime, all that. Um, what do you think of, like the character models and the surroundings, um, like all, what do you think of the CG? Well, this animation? came out like a couple of years after monster planet came out. And this either came out a little bit before, a little bit after planet eater. So it was around the time when that trilogy was concluding. Um, I really found the animation to be good. In fact, I think it's a little bit better than what we saw in the Godzilla anime trilogy. I find it interesting, especially when you've seen some of those earlier episodes, some of the backgrounds and even the vehicles are actual photographs or stills of, you know, the various neighborhoods in the Tokyo metropolitan area that they use as backdrops or vehicles and just, you know, animated them properly to move. I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, but the actual models and everything, I think they're an improvement from the Godzilla anime trilogy. There are times, like in the Reina Sayama concert, where Reina is dancing, where I really believe maybe mocap was used for some sequences because some of the animation was so fluid in some sequences. I really thought mocap was used. Uh, whether or not it was, I don't know. By and large, I thought it was real good. Some of the fights, especially uh, in the final one or two episodes, were a bit tough to follow. Part of that had more to do with the the lighting of those scenes than anything else. But by and large, I thought the animation was pretty darn solid. Uh, for me, I think the animation was pretty good, but um, I sort of noticed at times it seemed... Like some of the uh, the frame rates of some of these character models seem to be a little bit inconsistent, where it's, they seem to be a little bit uh, jumpy at times. I sort of noticed that uh, uh, kind of that subtle thing. Yeah, but no. then, um, um, was it? Uh, and then there's times where some of uh, the animation is pretty fluid in that regards. So. And um, I would say on average, like the frame rate of some of these character models uh, seem to be a little bit inconsistent um, at times. But uh, as far as uh, the fighting um, sequences in that regard were really good. And, um, and then as far as the additions of explosions uh, with some of these uh, shots... They seem to be using a little bit of too much uh, sh uh, smoke, and it seems like some of the smoke seemed um, a little too much, or some uh, how they animate them, or if they were some sort of uh, overlay in that regard, seemed to be a little bit out of place at times with uh, uh, the average animation and how it looked or the aesthetics of the animation. But um, what else? Um, I can't think of uh, much of anything. Oh, and then there are some uh, character models, like um, background characters or uh, background humans and, and the like. They, sometimes they were a little bit too robotic. You know, when, when you see average humans kind of walking by. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, but characters, they seem a little... They, they felt a little bit too robotic and a little bit inconsistent with some of the uh, with the, the main and supporting characters. And then if you compare the uh, the human models with the the kaiju models uh, that were pretty big, like the one in uh, Shibuya that uh, uh, Shin, uh, Shinjudo uh, encountered, it seemed like 
the skin of that and the animation or the, the look of it seemed, it felt a little bit out of place compared to the, uh, the human models. It, it just seemed a bit too detailed in that regard. Um, and, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how, what, uh, what kind of a specific word I'm want to, uh, put on that, but it just felt the kaiju just felt a little too out of place as far as the animation and sort of the look, uh, to it. But, uh, otherwise I would say the animation on average is all right. There's a l- some little inconsistencies here and there as far as the frame rate of these character models and uh, some things are a little don't quite match the aesthetic um, of the uh, uh, of the animation. Yeah, I mean, it's all something like this is always going to be a little weird. There were moments where it sort of reminded me of like late 90s early 2000s saturday morning cartoons that dabbled in 3d animation at points Uh like reboot (laughs) (laughs) no reboot was like early mid 90s and more um obscure than what's being shown here but it it, you know it remind me like late 90s early 2000s on occasion with some of those saturday morning cartoons Mm -hmm. uh jason asked me about the tone uh, the tone of it is pretty serious. <laughs> well, I said, ask me. Oh, uh, what do you think of the tone of the Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> this is one of the issues I'm having with this series. Uh, we sort of talked about it briefly with Ide and Hayata being a little bit different from their Showa era counterparts. Typically... Um, I don't mind too much of like a serious tone, but because this is Ultraman and when I think of Ultraman, I think of a little bit more lighthearted fare. And I understand, look, that the, the series on occasion got a little brutal with some of its violence, but it wasn't like every episode. I was a little put off by the tone here. Again, I'm all I give it an A for effort for trying something new. I just wasn't as much of a fan of how dark and uberly violent this thing got at points. Uh, and with it being hurting and with it being a direct sequel of the original Ultra. Yeah. And that was a big part. Like if this was a, a, an actual reboot or something like that, like a retelling of Ultraman, that would be totally different. But with this being a continuation, um, I was put off by the the uber seriousness and violence that permeates probably this whole series. I'm just going to go out on them and I feel pretty safe in saying it's throughout the whole series. Um, I did not care for a lot of that. I thought it was excessive, unnecessary and did not match with it being a direct sequel, at least to the original Ultraman. Yes, again, I understand that even the original Ultraman, I think, had a couple of moments where you could argue it was a little violent, but it wasn't as violent as some of the stuff portrayed here. There was not blood spurting all over the place like in some moments here. We don't have like a teenage boy who's 14, 15, however old he is, like his limbs getting cut off and getting like shanked by a, a, an assassin. Um, to me, it was too brutal. That's one of the things that's turning me off about this series right now. And I don't know if I'm ever going to fully buy into it. We'll kind of see as we proceed through the series. But as of right now, I'm not sold on the tone of it. Yeah. Yeah. I was sort of that way uh, when I first encountered uh, the manga of of this series many years ago when it came out and when reading through it saying that is sort of or getting the feeling that it was a direct sequel to uh the original ultraman tv show i was sort of think and then kind of going more into uh the manga when reading it at the time um i was i was 
sort of like, you know, I was thinking to myself, um, like, how could this be sort of this direct sequel to uh, the original TV show? And then you uh, time skip 10 or so or many years after the whole uh, 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 the ending of the original TV show where like you get all this advancement uh, and technology and all that. And then you have um, monsters being much smaller this time compared to them being giant for most of the time, although you get some of those aliens that are human size. Um, and that a lot regard. of them were maybe human size to start off with in the original series, but then grew to one size. That's yeah. you're, yeah, you're definitely talking in an area that I also have another issue with, with this particular series so far. Yeah. And then, um, and then you get, uh, uh, introduction to all the other, uh, some of the more noticeable um, characters from other TV shows like Dan Moriboshi or other kinds of Ultraman, Ultra 7, Ace. And then you get some sort of references of of all the other Ultraman, but you, they don't turn into Ultraman like um, that Jack guy who lives in that uh, uh, alien uh, zone or town or district, wherever you call it. And then you get uh, Dada, but he's actually, this one is called Adad, <laughs> backwards for Dada. And so it's it's sort of confusing, even though it's supposed to be a direct sequel. Like, some things have ch- changed to where it's sort of confusing, you know, with and even the character tones of some said characters like Ide, a good example, and also Dan Moriboshi, where they... Uh, sort of deviate or really deviate from their character ties compared to uh, the uh, the original TV shows. Yeah, I. It, we even get one flashback where we see the original Ultraman fighting a giant kaiju. It was briefly, but we see that at one point. It's brought up numerous times throughout the course of these 13 episodes that the original Ultraman, you know, would fight giant monsters and stuff like that. Irena Sayama, one of her deals is that the original Ultraman didn't do a good enough job of protecting people. Um, you know, when she was younger, because she lost her mother in the hospital, when Ultraman, the original Ultraman was fighting a giant monster. I am not, first of all, the whole Iron Man thing, you know, I think it's kind of cool on one level, but then on another level, it definitely is a a complete uh, inspiration of Iron Man. So it's a unique take on Ultraman. But the fact that we don't have any giant kaiju and this Ultraman is for whatever reason, unable to grow to giant size. It seems off because with this being a direct sequel, to that original series, at least the giant kaiju should be showing up. Bare minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing too is I, the, I other thing, the other thing too is that how how do they uh, how does the science patrol get a hold of this uh, specium technology or specium heat rays and all that uh, stuff that uh, the original yeah. had. That's that's the other thing uh, to go about, but that's that's a whole different other animal. <laughs> well, and you know, again, because we didn't complete the series, that could end up being answered as we mm-hmm. go through this. I have a bet it won't, but I'm going to leave my <laughs> mind open and hope. I would say seventy percent chance I won't get answered. <laughs> I'm I'm more like ninety five percent sure I won't even get addressed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, some of the decisions, again, I give an A for effort. I just think the execution and sort of the, like, it, it's fine to have thought this through, but then when you really think it through, and maybe if they had done some test animation stuff and maybe put it in front of a focus group or something like that, maybe 
the focus group could have helped him out and say, nah, this isn't exact. I, I don't know. I, I don't or, know anything as far as behind the scenes here. Well, it is um, with it being with the anime being an adaptation to uh, this manga. Yeah, you would think that uh, who whoever started the manga. Let me let me just see here. Uh, the, it was written by Eiichi uh, Shimizu, Shimizu, and then illustrated by Tomohiro uh, Shimo Gucci. Like as far as far as the writer, it's like. I would try to do as much research behind the whole Ultraman franchise as much as I can and see what would work, how, what to add, what not to add in this. And also, if you, with it being a direct sequel to the original Ultraman, try to have some sort of consistency as far as some of the atmosphere and the tone of not only the overallness of this manga or anime, but also the characters try to keep them a bit more consistent with their original counterpart. Yeah. I mean, again, like I said here, odd number of minutes ago, I would have been okay if this was just a, like a reboot. The you know, if this, yeah. This, you know, um, but the fact that it's a sequel to that original Ultraman show, at least, it leaves you an awful lot of questions as far as, well, then, okay. And a little bit of confusion. I, I'm okay with this Ultraman maybe not growing to immense heights because he's wearing a robotic suit, mm-hmm. but there still should be giant kaiju coming around, at least on occasion. Mm-hmm. That, even that's not happening, oddly enough. And so, I... <laughs> I, I was left with at the end of season one with more questions than answers. And I understand that they were hoping and they eventually did. Yeah. Come out with successful um, or su- should I say successive seasons? Um, I, I just, I still don't understand what's going on. And again, like I was telling you before we came on, I sort of hesitate to condemn this season because we don't have the full story yet because some Mm -hmm. of this stuff, if not all of it may end up being answered as we progress here. But I think the elephant in the room being, Hey, how come this Ultraman can't grow to enormous size? How come there aren't giant Kaiju, which is sort of central to what Ultraman is about. Not even that is brought up. Even though you, you I, so, I don't understand that. Even though we technically get kaiju in a few episodes here, but they aren't kaiju size. No, they're anyway. they're just humanoid aliens, more or less. Maybe maybe about as as high as uh, the predator or alien, whichever. Yeah, it's just. I'm hoping it gets answered. But it's not even really addressed by and large here in the first but, season. But like you, uh, chances of things being answered for that probably not going to happen. I, I give it a seventy yeah. percent chance on that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, we just want to go ahead and. Def- oh, yeah. Right. Otherwise, is, is there anything else you want to add, or just want to dive in? Just dive into final thoughts. <laughs> All right. Why, why don't you give your final thoughts in the grade on season one? Oh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, again, the story is so much more uh, dense and convoluted than it really needs to be. Characters are fine. Um, and the representation of some of the kaiju I think are interesting. Like a Dodd, I think, is a unique design and all that. I'm kind of cool with that. Um, and uh, the Ultraman suits, I think, even though I'm kind of peeved, it's a Iron Man ripoff. At the same time, I find it to be unique in that this time, instead of it just being sort of a superhero with, you know, a, a capsule of sorts to mm-hmm. uh, turn himself into a superhero, it's done through machine. Um, this is definitely a unique take on the Ultraman franchise, but I'm still left with a lot of questions. And that's not just because this. You know, we didn't finish the whole series. I'm left with questions such as why aren't there at least giant kaiju occasionally rampaging? Excuse me. 
on Tokyo or just Japan in general at various points. Um, why, why hasn't that happened yet? How come that just even in general has not even been addressed by some character? How come it's not even addressed as far as why Shinjiro and Moroboshi can't grow to enormous size and fight giant kaiju like the original Ultraman, which again, this series is a direct sequel of. Um, stuff like that makes not only make me scratch my head, but I'm still left with like, like th this has to be addressed. Like this is central to who Ultraman is. And, um, on the one and on the other hand too like i'm sort of on the edge of my seat to try to figure out okay who this informant is that takes seiji surrogate dad at the end i always sort of had a weird feeling about him that maybe he was a shady character ado one of the heads of the science patrol was sort of missing for a bit too i sort of had my suspicions about him early in the series that maybe he could end up ultimately turning on the science patrol that hasn't happened yet but they're they set him up for that possibility mm -hmm. um, well what the hell was that giant spaceship <laughs> who was it where did it come from why isn't there a ton of debris falling onto the earth and all that is beyond me um I would assume it could be part of the Star Cluster Council. That but again, nothing like said after that. There's mm -hmm. no debris falling down or anything. You even had the mothership from Independence Day <laughs> having some of its debris <laughs> come onto the Earth. And I think that was further away from planet Earth than this thing was. So it's just like I'm left feeling frustrated because on the one hand, it, a lot of different garbage stories were being told along the way without an ultimate story thread going on. And I understand some of that was for human character development, but even then I would argue some of it went on longer than it should have. If I were to look at this script for season one, I would have said you can cut enough of this stuff out to where the, instead of 13 episodes for this season, it probably should have been no more than eight. And there's a lot of fluff here. I'm sure a lot of it does count and does matter, but I think it drags on longer than it should. And I'm deeply frustrated so far by much of this series because, like I just said, I walk away from season one with more questions about this series than I had even starting this series. And I'm not going to condemn this thing yet because I still need to see seasons two and three to really get a good idea as far as does any of this pay off? Is any of this uh, answered? But right now, I am left with sort of a sour taste in my mouth. Um, bits and parts of the story I do like. The tone I am not a fan of. I think the uber violence on display here is a turnoff. And if this were a reboot, I probably would be more willing to go with it. But again, because it's a direct sequel to the Showa Ultraman series, which was more lighthearted in its portrayal of violence, to me it's, it's like whiplash-inducing. And so I more than likely will end up changing my grade on this once we get this whole thing said and done in, in a few weeks. Um, it's fine, but I... I think out of the Netflix stuff we've watched, this so far is my least favorite, perhaps. Um, Ultraman Rising was problematic in quite a few ways, but at least I could understand it and still kind of understand and get why the things it did. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm not sure. I will probably end up, when everything's said and done, give it a higher rating. Because I gave uh, Ultraman Rising, what, a D plus, I think I did? I um, think so. I'm giving this a... You know what? Actually, I'm giving this a C minus, actually. Um, I think on some level, now that I think about it, it is a little bit better than Ultraman Rising. But it's got a lot of questions. Here's my caveat. I'm going to assume that all of this, 
all these questions and stuff get <clears throat> answered. I'm not saying they will, because I still have yet to see the rest of it. If it does, I will give this season a better grade. If it doesn't, I guarantee you it will be a lower grade than Ultraman Rising and really than the series as a whole. It's probably not going to get a good grade. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to give it a C- minus right now. It's very interesting, but there are some decisions that were made that are very questionable and some that I really do not like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As far as season one goes, like what we've talked about and what I've talked about, there's a lot of side stories within just this season alone. Um, compared to a lot of the other TV shows and besides just the main storyline of who's behind this uh, uh, plane explosion and what have you and it in the sort it and uh, granted with Netflix with how they kind of run their whole uh, thing that This could have been one season alone and there could have been a chance of them not renewing uh, other seasons beyond season one. Hence, there could have been many reasons why they've crammed a lot of stuff within just one season alone. And it just sort of made a, a little bit of a muddled mess at times. And with uh having three ultraman in here it just felt a little too much at times and i can go on about that and as far as the animation it's all right but there's some little inconsistencies here and there and as far as aesthetics like some things didn't feel uh like it's part of this uh series in that regard and as far as the characters yeah they were they were all right but at certain aspects they sort of deviated or really deviated from their original uh counterparts of the ultraman franchise and uh and with it being a direct sequel yeah it just sort of throws you into a loop of the aesthetic, the atmosphere between the original uh, Ultraman show and this direct sequel of that original series. It sort of kind of throws you into a loop and sort of makes things a little bit confusing where like some characters, uh, like I said earlier, like characters are, completely different or a little bit different from their original counterparts and even some of the aliens like some of their names somehow they switched <laughs> like dada it's now a dod um but uh yeah it's there should have been some consistencies as far as the writing and probably should have done a little bit more research to try to if you want to tie things uh, uh, to it being a direct sequel you should at least tie it as such instead, instead of just being a completely different animal I mean yeah I can see if it, w- if it was going to be a, a sort of a retelling or a reboot of the original Ultraman but with it being a direct sequel to the original Ultraman it just sort of really through throws you into a loop and then just sort of make the make things a little bit confusing at times and also if they were going to if netflix wasn't going to renew uh more than just one season yeah there's going to be some questions left answered in certain aspects of the area but then um also sort of tying thing certain things up but yeah there's going to be some questions uh lingering if there weren't going to be any more seasons after this season um yeah as far as far as season one for me i would give it i would at least give it a c plus 
uh, here so far, sort of kind of in the middle ground uh, in that regard. Uh, but we'll see how things go if there's going to be uh, if some of those questions that are going to be asked, who knows? Um, but yeah, that's that's all I'm going to give it. Give season one for right now. Hopefully, it gets uh, better um, from here on out. Uh, so we'll we'll see in that. Uh, so season one so far, uh, I'll give this a C plus. All right. And with that said, thank you so much for joining us. We will discuss off air here shortly whether or not we're going to do uh, the rest of the series in an overall review uh, for next time. Otherwise, we will have two more episodes of the Ultraman anime where we discuss seasons two and three and finish this part off and then probably go back to Common Riders. So with that, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Yeah, and if you and then again, if you see a subscribe button down below or above, make sure to hit that subscribe button as well. Smash the uh, the like button. And if you're listening to us on any of the audio uh, podcast platforms, make sure to subscribe to us and give us a rating as well. And so with that, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>